Now it gives me great pleasure um, to welcome everybody to our first summary panel for today. If you've been with us the entire day, um, well, when you begin, you'll see that many of these panelists um, will be coming in and out of this uh, um, conference. But I would like to now um, introduce Dr. Sarah Cody. Um, Dr. Cody is the a physician and epidemiologist who today serves as the County Health Officer at the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, a position she's held since 2013. She is a Stanford graduate who earned her medical degree at Yale, where I had the pleasure of meeting her early in her career trajectory. She then did her residency in internal medicine at Stanford Medicine, followed by a CDC EIS fellowship before serving in the Santa Clara Public Health Department. She's famous in these parts as being the first to call for sheltering in place, thereby really saving thousands of lives. We are grateful to have her back with us today. Dr. Cody, on to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about public health. And thank you, Dean Miner, for your comments, um, really raising up how important uh, public health is and how, how pervasive it is to the well-being for all of us. Um, I'm delighted to moderate this panel today on public health and to bring a global perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm the local county health officer just here for Santa Clara County for 2 million people, but I must say that there's much from uh, our county that, that I think echoes what, what's likely been experienced in various parts of the world. So um, I'm really delighted by our panel today, uh, interested in hearing perspectives, diverse perspectives um, from uh, leaders around the globe. Um, and then we'll, uh, after five minute presentations by each of our panelists, we'll come back um, and discuss the themes uh, that have emerged. Um, so uh, we have uh, five, uh, panelists today uh, to bring perspectives uh, from around the globe, um, from Peru, Rwanda, Japan, uh, India, uh, and, and here at home. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first uh, panelist, Dr. Patty Garcia, um, who will provide uh, some perspective and, um, uh, and comments from Peru. Dr. Garcia? Um, thank you so much. Um, I would like to share my screen. Thanks. So um, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to share some of the lessons that we have learned uh, dealing with the pandemic here in Peru. Um, first of all, Peru is a very diverse country with about 33 million individuals. And we have, we have a fast growing economy uh, but was, which is based on 70% of the labor force working in the informal or in the unregulated system. And with more than 40% of people that are self-employed, which means that we have the highest rates of informality and self-employment in the Latin American region. Unfortunately, as part of the context, we have a weak social protection system for housing and overcrowding, and we have been dealing with this political crisis and instability within the country. That meant that just for the area of health, we have the change of about 12 ministers of health. Um, our health system is fragmented, under budgeted. 92% of the population is served by the public sector, but we have a poor quality public uh, sector services, and we have a very weak primary health primary healthcare system. And according to the Global Health Security Index, which is um, actually a self-report from 2019, we knew even before the pandemic that we had a deficient system in terms of biosafety laboratories, epidemiology workforce, and emergency response plans, and a very limited capacity for molecular testing nationally. So um, knowing all these problems, but Peru began its pandemic response preparations very early. Even in February, we had already a national plan preparation, uh, a national plan for preparation and response um, against COVID. But there were delays and difficulties in purchasing 
PPEs and supplies. And although, I mean, we had the first case in March the 6th and in March 15, already the president declared the state of national emergency lockdown. And with very strict controls in citizens' movements, um, we, the pandemic really uh, was overwhelming in our country. Uh, we have had schools that had remained closed until now. Masks were required very early. We have curfews and lockdowns on and off, but the cases rapidly started to rise. And so far, um, we have been able to test probably more than 11 million people, but mostly with rapid tests. And um, we have about almost 2 million positive cases recorded in our systems, but less than a third have had a PCR. Right now, we are in our second wave with new variants and um, only about 700,000 people we have received two doses of vaccines. And this is what is happening in Peru. We had this first wave. We are in this second wave, hopefully coming down. But um, unfortunately, Peru has been hit very hard, although we have a very um, a early response. And um, unfortunately, we are at the top of mortality in Latin America and in the rest of the world. So asking ourselves, what are the factors that had caused these terrible results in Peru? Where there are contextual factors that I mentioned, like poor housing, overcrowding, social norms, people behavior, informality, and a very politicized environment and distrust on the government that had resulted in people not following the lockdown not following social distancing strategies or mask use. And we even had difficulties isolating cases at home. We had a limited laboratory capacity and lack of supplies that have undermined the implementation of an adequate case identification tracing strategies. Because of that, the country decided at least to buy something which was a massive purchase of serologic rapid tests that initially were very helpful, but they were not good for early identification and isolation of cases. And it induced a delay on the deployment of the capacity for molecular testing because the country, actually the government, felt very comfortable using the rapid test. Everybody liked the rapid tests, but they were overused. People were using it as health certificates and there was a false sense of security. Because of our weak health system and because the whole response was a hospital center centered pandemic response, because primary care centers were closed, there were not enough PPEs, um, that caused an overwhelm of our hospitals uh, that by, by start, they didn't have enough ICU beds and no oxygen and other health problems were ignored. Um, we had the use of medications without evidence treatment guidelines and treatment packages that were given by the government in a very populistic way with hydroxychloroquine, acetromycin and ivermectin that caused adverse events, toxicity, a, a huge antimicrobial resistance and complications and self-medication and a false sense of security. And finally, this lack of communication campaign and an inadequate information about public health policies and decision-making processes caused even more confusion and people did not follow the lockdown or any of the measures that we had. So finally, for my five minutes, I would like to close this on some conclusions and lessons learned. Although Peru was a country that it started early with the restriction and preventive measures, which are still ongoing, we have been hit very hard by the pandemic. And there are several reasons for this, some contextual factors, because contextual factors are critical. We need to redesign social protection strategies, address inequities and vulnerable and, and think about vulnerable populations. And there are things that need to change because otherwise, if you don't have political stability and clear leadership, it is very difficult to address a pandemic. We must invest in strengthening health systems capacities like primary care, hospitals, ICUs, health information systems and laboratory capacities. Rapid tests were an, initially a useful alternative, but um, they were not very effective in the end. Decisions should be made on best evidence available. We need science and we need to uh, really listen to um, scientists and we need social science, not just medical science to see if we can afford uh, or we can uh, improve the way we do things and try to um, approach behavior of people. For the lack of supplies, we need investments in technology and science. 
and um, we have been talking about independence, technological independence in the Latin American region. It's not only Peru that has suffered, it's the whole Latin American region. We need effective communication and transparency, and there is a need of community engagement for public health understanding, preparedness, and responses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. I, I think already you've highlighted um, it, it's, in, it's really incredible to me how some of the, uh, the issues that you've brought up and highlighted are ones that we have um, experienced uh, here in the county, despite being very, very, very different places um, there that we have a, a lot in, in common so far. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, um, Dr. Bina Wahoo, uh, who will provide a uh, perspective regarding uh, what's happening in, in uh, Rwanda. Um, welcome, uh, uh, so glad to see you. Um, and um, uh, without further ado, um, please, please share. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, um, hello to my sister from Latin America, Patty, and uh, all those uh, friends that I have here. Hello everyone and thank you for having me here today. For the next five minutes, I would like to share some lessons from Rwanda's COVID-19 response, focusing on four pillars that have allowed us to contain the number of cases to less than 25,950 uh, up today, that was last night midnight, and the number of deaths to less than 350. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, past this, let's go to slide three. So those pillars are not the only one. I just want to take four major pillars because five minutes is very little. So the first one is the government reliance on scientific evidence to make all decisions. Rwanda quickly adopted the known evidence-based intervention and enforced them throughout the country. For instance, temperature check in airport began in January 2020, two months before the first case um, uh, uh, of COVID happened in the country. And all the, 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 for the travelers, because we know we don't have a case in, the, in Rwanda, it will come from outside at certain point. So all travelers, uh, the, the information for contact tracing were taking starting in January. Flight to China was stopped because we didn't know how to manage and we have a flight direct to China. So the first case was in March 2020, uh, two months later. Uh, we also wear masks mandatory. That means like you have to have a seat belt in your car. The mask is mandatory if you walk outside your house. And this as soon as the International Normative Health Agency, WHO and CDC, informed the world that we needed masks. There also there was some mismanagement at that level, but it's another story. Uh, so um, the strategy to implement the evidence-based intervention were adapted as needed according to the global context, the national context, the community context. And for instance, if you see that uh, there was a spike uh, in the number of uh, cases in January. Uh, we had a lockdown. Uh, and for this, during the lockdown, we have a population with uh, more than 45 people living under the poverty line. So we had to bring to them the food every day if we want them to stay home. And this was done. Another example is the way we uh, did our list of vaccination priority. All the people working in, um, all the health workers, uh, professional or community uh, one, but also the people above 60, even in prison and refugee camp uh, uh, were vaccinated as the rule. And when the vaccine were finished, because you know that COVAX is more not so well functioning because uh, they need more money. Uh, so now we wait for the next um, uh, bunch of vaccine to vaccinate uh, uh, the rest of the population. But the adoption of the EBI will not have been possible without making sure uh, they are accessible to all. 
uh, that's important to ensure that all individuals adhere to the various COVID-19 measures. Rwanda provided free uh, service HIV, such as testing, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, ICU uh, treatment, etc. Moreover, giving to every day scientifically based in, uh, information was key. But I want to come back to the informal sector because the majority of our people are working in informal sector and it's like in many uh, African countries. So those people have to eat, to work today to eat tomorrow, even if they are not poor, they don't have savings. And to mitigate that, there was cash transfer created and when I say that the food to the poor were given, 150 households were supported by food in the, the Kigali city in January 2021, when the second shorter la lockdown was uh, created because of the spike. So also based the response to solidarity. And the example were coming from our leaders. The government official, uh, first the president did it, he said, all my salary of April will be for the national funds to support those in need. And government official followed and many in the country followed by example of solidarity in place of example of promoting individualism, it was key in the success. Rwanda was able to enforce these strategies by levering leveraging the trust the community have in the public sector. And this is important. You don't create trust in the middle of the war uh, or the, the, the crisis. And Welcome Trust analyzed, Welcome Trust and Galliop did a study uh, in 2019. And that study shown that the Rwandan population has the highest confidence in its public health system in the world. When you know how poor this, uh, this um, uh, public sector is. We, ha we have, I hear a, a party who says uh, not enough ICU, not enough respirator. At the beginning of the crisis, we had only 200 respirator for the country. So our only safety was blocking COVID to penetrate in community and in the country. So while this trust was built through decades, all decision making and explication, explanation are trust. And this trust was central to the adherence of COVID measure. Um, the ability to maintain the delivery of essential ordinary health service was key and is central to the success of COVID. Meaning we had to respond to COVID to prepare that, but continue all the other services. And for this, we create a parallel system to COVID accessible to all, and people can be uh, can be uh, can reach uh, the the system through by calling a number, and there is special ambulances with people in full PPE coming to their home and bring them to a place to do the test. It's negative, they bring back home. It's positive, they were bringing them to a center, even without sign, uh, and this allow early uh, care of people who are affected, infected by COVID and uh, not very less needed of uh, respirators. Uh, we, uh, we can discuss, we have also uh, created a resilient health sector in Rwanda that allowed the services to continue. Meaning you can see here, the vaccination didn't see a decrease. The family planning tool didn't see a decrease. Uh, the, the, the delivery in health um, uh, facilities didn't decrease. And this is because the health sector was resilient and the community themselves found a way to circumvent their fare because there was a, a re, uh, they, they were afraid to get COVID when they go in ordinary health center, but because the treatment of COVID positive case were in a parallel system in center in each region, they were reassured after uh, after 30 days. So the decentralization system was also a key pillar with health community health workers elected by the village. A village is 200 houses maximum and giving the information and also now doing the testing and uh, following home 
uh, isolation, uh, this also is key. So leverage strategy that you have before and make sure that it's for all. Make sure you mitigate the, the harsh time uh, uh, the population have because in, in our countries, because they were poor and they don't have food every day on the table if they cannot work and do cash transfer accordingly has helped uh, creating a solid response to COVID that now show the result with only less than 350 deaths and uh, also uh, less than 200, uh, uh, no, 25,950 uh, positive cases of, of COVID. So I thank you. I think the rest will be discussed during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm really, uh, I, I know we'll be discussing more in the panel, but I'm really struck uh, regarding your comments around trust, um, trust in the leadership and trust in the health system and solidarity. That's uh, something um, uh, and no notably absent um, in many, many communities here. Um, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, uh, Dr. Kazu. Uh, Jindai from Tohoku University in Japan. Welcome. Uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Hey, how are you doing? Very nice to meet you all. And uh, um, this is my, uh, uh, this is about uh, already midnight is past and I got the second dose of vaccine a few hours ago. So I feel goofy and I, if I look goofy, I think I attribute this to the vaccination. But anyway, um, first, I just would like to uh, talk about the, how we, um, uh, excuse me, how we, um, um, uh, interact with the academia and uh, government when we do a uh, 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 response at the very early stage. Very interestingly, I think this is the first time in the history in Japan actually that the government of Shell and then academia like us um, work together and then especially in the epidemiology field and then we kind of decide how we kind of deal with um, uh, how we deal with uh, COVID-19 at the early stage, especially at the time that we didn't have a, a strat, have a, uh, uh, enough labs and or PCRs and stuff. So anyway, the response task force supported the ministry's effort toward early detection and appropriate care for severe cases. And then we do early identification of any response of case clusters and then Interestingly, not just uh, epidemiology part, but we do um, involve in the risk communication or to change the promotion to behavior change of the public. Next slide, please. So this is the kind of small, uh, uh, like a uh, um, like a cartoon uh, that the uh, how we kind of decide to do uh, a case investigation. Uh, if you look at the right upper corner, there's a very small figure, but this is something we found out uh, like in the February that the more than 150 cases of COVID-19 case was actually analyzed like within a few days. And then we found that the, uh, um, the those cases were well, actually most of the cases did not transmit the virus or at least they didn't look like to transmit the virus. And then we didn't see uh, most of the cases uh, actually uh, asymptomatic or presymptomatic or not symptomatic at all. But if you look at the, and you see like four, nine, 12 cases, sounds like uh, some cases are actually spread disease pr pretty much, you know, that often leading to the cluster formation. So that's why we thought that, let's say, if you see the red person in the right corner, uh, that the, we thought that we did those victory to try to find out the, um, uh, let's see, find out the, um, the case in the like avenue or as a super spreading event that we thought that very effective and efficient to do those like a tracing pattern. Next slide, please. So this is again a uh, super spreading. It. Then we found, or you find a lot of, you know, you have found uh, many uh, places that we can have the clusters, such as like a gymnastics, uh, yeah, gymnastics, gyms, sorry, gyms, and uh, like a live event and uh, live event and. Uh, uh, and then many people can get together without a good ventilation. And then if you have a smaller number of people, uh, we have some, had uh, some issues 
that there's nightlife industries, like, uh, you know, a uh, um, person goes to uh, um, like a pub, special pubs, and then t this, uh, talk with the hostess or a hostel. Um, and then, you know, they are very close to each other, of course, at the time with that mask, and then they get um, uh, the um, infection each other. And next slide, please. And then we found that this closed space, crowded places, close contact settings with three seasons. Interestingly enough, again, we have only 150 cases at the time and then analyze it. And then at the time we thought everything is droplet and, and contact um, um, infection. But, you know, because of like some, you know, our imaginations and maybe hypothesis kind of led to that idea that maybe ventilation is important, which is, I think, a uh, hint of the errors of infection that people are now discussing these days. So uh, those kind of data can help to change the um, uh, people's behavior. And then and uh, government was not very good at doing a risk communication by themselves. So expert in the uh, um, in the buildings actually tried to use the social uh, social media such as Twitter's, Facebooks. Then it tried to convey the idea of three C's, and then actually that was really helpful in terms of. Uh, avoid, uh, uh, teach them how to avoid those like uh, uh, three seats. Next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, so this is the, uh, um, our uh, epi uh, graph. And uh, as you see, start, uh, the X axis is the time and then the uh, vertical axis is the cases in the right side and left side, and the red line is the um, effective reproduction numbers. So I think we are in terms of very good at, you know, uh, and then blue arrows as actually the uh, state of emergency declarations. So as you probably know some of them, but the uh, we didn't have a lot of have mandatory or uh, uh, strict rules compared with uh, other countries that we don't have a actual lockdowns. We very dependent on the public or peer pressure, but whatever you call it. And it sounds like it worked very well in the first and second waves. But as you see, the third wave and the country in that we are in a fourth wave. So intermingled with the slow rollout of vaccinations that seems like people doesn't listen anymore. And then uh, we have some issues that we had things that just keep coming. And uh, next slide, please. So um, we don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a fancy slides to talk about more than ma majors, but I think, uh, you know, uh, I, as I was in a, uh, more like AP side of pillar of the outbreak response in the government side. Um, so I just like to, uh, talk about what's wrong, I think, specific to us. And then maybe I hope that this is gener uh, generalizable to your country or your county or your state. But um, there's the factors, positive factors or negative factors associated with the behavior change. Um, first, people listen that, okay, we need to focus on three Cs. Sure, we need to wear a mask, uh, you know, uh, wash your hands and then to try to do physical distancing. But just, you know, people are now used to it, um, tired of it. Um, and then um, we are st in a, we are in a regulation state of emergency right now, but uh, it was in the train and people are, uh, there are a lot of people there, you know. And the second is that vaccine rollout is not that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, speedy. It's very, a little bit late side, but actually when you take a look at uh, uh, like what data, but it seems like not just us in a, for example, Western Pacific regions, like in Southeast Asia, some people, uh, some countries are good. Some countries is as low as, as we are. I'm not excuse, uh, excusing, but I think, you know, uh, we are uh, relatively okay in terms of numbers and death tolls. So I think, but still, you know, vaccines now, because people are not listening to non-pharmaceutical interventions now, we, uh, we need a vaccine, but as you see, we are very, uh, slow side we have uh, probably like three percent of like total population has been vaccinated and i'm a, i'm a doctor but i got the second vaccine just a few hours ago as you see and i think 
that's okay. It's our how we do. And then, but I think things is that the we probably from your perspective, we have we are going to have our rim. We probably I'm not sure, but we are going to have our Olympics soon. But the uh, we are not probably not good at you know uh, doing uh, risk communication, the leadership. You know, be, you know, many experts experts or like TV commentator in the TVs. You know, they talk about whatever they want. But I think we want something from leadership, governors and prime minister, whoever are responsible to making a decision. So. I think whatever they make, that's okay. But I think it should be transparent, even to us. We are not sure what's the plan yet. I just take a look at the Olympic, uh, you know, the uh, headquarter, Tokyo headquarter website. You know, they said they they do, uh, you know, you know, they do try to uh, avoid. They do they uh, follow the protocols to avoid three season stuff, but. Again, we are not sure. And then, uh, as you see, that the, uh, for example, people coming all over the world, you know, to uh, join the um, the Olympics, and then nobody know what's going to happen. So anyway, um, that's my slides. And thank you very much. I'm looking forward to talk more in during the next session as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your comments, and I, I hope we can have a little bit of discussion, perhaps about the Olympics. <laughs> Get everyone's thoughts on that. Um, uh, our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Girharda Babu from the Indian Institute of Public Health. Uh, interested in hearing uh, your perspectives and um, the challenges that uh, that India is facing with the with the current wave. Uh, welcome, and uh, looking forward to your your comments. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am discussing regarding uh, the challenges that India is facing uh, through the second wave, and as you see in the title slide itself, the surge is. Uh, unprecedented. We have not seen uh, anything like this in the first wave. So therefore, it has taken uh, several states and the health system by surprise. Next slide, please. If I were to compare uh, the different waves in different countries and see the quantum by which the number of cases rose in India, uh, it's, it's only in Italy and United Kingdom where from first to second wave, the jump has been so dramatically more. So in UK, it's 421% rise in the number of cases in the peak of the wave from the first to second. It's around 522% in Italy from first to second. If you look at India, it is 344%. Although the relative percentages might be lower compared to these two from first to second, uh, if you were to then quantify in terms of the number of severe cases that require uh, critical care uh, in terms of either the ventilatory support or oxygen support, it, for each day, uh, we need 182,000 beds in terms of catering to the surge in cases. And if you were to look at the other group, which is having moderate respiratory distress, it will be nearly 546,000 cases each day. So this is phenomenal in terms of any health system that can cater to and the number of beds, the number of uh, people who are trained uh, who can assist in the care uh, is simply uh, mind boggling. Uh, that's why India had to go through uh, these devastation, sadness and despair all around. Uh, because of this sudden surge in cases, uh, we can uh, discuss if time permits regarding the reasons and uh, what can be done about it, but I'm just limiting my talk only to the clinical management aspects. Uh, next slide, please. This is how generally the clinical management uh, is followed throughout India with some exceptions here and there. Uh, all the people with severe respiratory distress uh, will go to facilities where intensive care unit is available. 
all the people with moderate illness will go to a dedicated health center where oxygen support is available and also trained manpower is there most of the people with mild illness are either isolated at home or they go to something called covid care center now in the second wave because of the sudden surge in cases there has been uncontrolled uh, you know transmission from one area to another so many people who came in severe distress did not find the number of minimum number of beds and trained manpower so that's why they are at higher risk if you compare the case fatality rate between the first and second wave in the first wave it was 1.4% in the second wave it is 0.8% although with a lower case fatality rate the number of deaths are simply more because of the absolute number of cases increase so since severe distress is not being able to managed well now you have this vicious cycle even the people with mild and moderate respiratory distress cannot find oxygenated beds therefore they get into severe distress and that's how the deaths uh, during the second wave surged and there is a lag time between uh, case surge and death surge so therefore we are yet to see uh, uh, the real number of deaths in the uh, future in addition to this uh, the crematoriums were full the burial grounds were full and the, all the hospitals were full currently we see some relief in mumbai and delhi which are large metros uh, we are just going through probably peak in bangalore and now the rural areas are surging next slide please in terms of what's being done uh, the capacity of the oxygen is sort of uh, uh, in terms of what we produce within the india is there but then in terms of distribution and uh, transport uh, was a major problem that is being attended to by using armed forces and indian railways and also a phenomenal uh, amount of support from both uh, domestic and international um, uh, you know good souls i would say who have uh, voluntarily gotten together to help the unprecedented situation in india in the health system we see uh, that there is strain on the system due to several factors as i clearly explained earlier there is critical care Uh, uh capacity being completely uh, short of supply in terms of that uh, there is this uh, uh, hope that remdesivir would sort of treat everybody and therefore there was an artificial uh, uh, sort of uh, a shortage created for remdesivir because everybody wanted to buy it and still many people have stigma to get tested and get treated so therefore that results in several other problems Uh, in rural areas and hard to reach areas there are still a uh, shortage of hospital beds and medicine and vaccines the way forward uh, is uh, probably uh, also what india did not expect uh, they wanted we probably are uh, in terms of absolute numbers we are doing vaccine coverage really well but then only 2.5% of the total population is vaccinated so Uh, you would know what is the shortfall and then how can we uh, close this gap next please so in terms of uh, the lessons learned now uh, while we are focusing on clinical management alone uh, we need to ensure that if the lesson number 1 is that if you fail to understand how the second wave or any future wave is going to emerge and if you fail to contain in the early stages you are going to pay a huge price as a system so therefore stepping up public health uh, approach is very important and this is where uh, wherever the human resources are deficient they will have to be hired permanently not on a contract or temporary basis and most of the urban areas do not have uh, people required for contact tracing or testing that's why primary health care services in the urban areas needs to be strengthened in terms of the medicine supplies and critical care capacity we need to make sure that for future waves we have battle ready workforce and also resources things like oxygen demand and supply we need to streamline by ensuring that every remote area has access to oxygen and steroids which are mostly life saving in this crisis 
Next, please. One of the major challenges uh, we found during this current surge is that the hospital systems are overburdened due to uh, many factors. This needs to be resolved by what I term as 3E e strategy, which means an, uh, better triage systems making efficient entry into the hospitals. Only people who deserve to be treated with severe or moderate gets admitted into the hospital. Efficient exit, because once uh, people get all right, uh, if, even if not completely functionally all right, but if they are able to get discharged or move to a different facility in step down uh, therapy, they should be going to other centers and give away the ICU beds or uh, critical uh, oxygenated beds to others. Finally, we need to strengthen the hospitals in terms of whatever supplies they require during the surge. And we are uh, testing out different models in Mumbai and Bangalore where volunteers are working with the hospitals to make sure that the hospitals are not overburdened. The way forward is to enhance both the coverage and the speed of vaccination. And this is where probably the entire world needs to get together. And this is where even India can have a turnaround story. Uh, if man manufacturers come to India and tie up with the comp uh, companies within India, I think we have the capacity to expand uh, coverage to the entire world. At uh, the same time, concurrent genomic sequencing and improving data governance is also important. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, your your very um, uh, humbling uh, to hear to to hear your comments on on what's what's happening now. And I I, I think you've highlighted uh, themes that others have highlighted as well. Uh, we have one more presentation before we move to discussion, and I'd like to introduce um, Chris LeBeau, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, fra, uh, from Stanford, um, from uh, the Department of Epidemiology. Welcome, and we look forward to your comments. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sarah, and the care, care team. I'm from Stanford's Epidemiology Department, and I am here to present a bit different um, of work than what you've heard from so far in that we are collecting data. Um, we're going to be sharing about a study that we've been doing um, within Bangladeshi hospitals um, with our collaborators at ICDDRB, who we work with on a number of different projects. Um, if you want to proceed to the next slide. Um, so as Dr. Jendai um, mentioned in his earlier talk, there's been a lot of discussion um, and more acknowledgement recently about the possible role of aerosol transmission of COVID-19. So within, as many of you know, within CDC WHO guidelines up to this point, um, much of the COVID transmission pathway has been thought to have been droplet transmitted, which really affects what um, the kind of guidance is for how people are meant to stay away from COVID of the masks and social distancing. But if COVID-19 is actually also airborne, this really changes our perspective of what's considered safe. And if it can stay in the air longer and just kind of perpetuate in the air in closed spaces, um, this really changes how we would want to um, set up um, ways of keeping people safe from COVID, keeping people away from COVID. Um, and there have been several papers looking at the environmental sampling of air in hospital spaces. Um, but most of these samples have, have done it with people that we know are shedding COVID um, virus at the time of sampling and usually have done it in the vicinity of patients. So doing it close to patients just to see if it's possible to have um, aerosol transmitted um, virus. However, what we've been doing over the last, um, since October of last year has been setting up a project to see in um, different hospital settings across Bangladesh, both in COVID wards, in ICU rooms, as well as in non-COVID spaces. So places where people are waiting um, in the outpatient department, um, in bathrooms, in other places around these hospitals. If you just go in and sample the air from that space, um, setting our sampler at the kind of rate that a normal human breathes, what percentage of these different spaces around the hospitals are um, have COVID virus just in the air? Um, and 
Also, I want to note that in the samples that have been done, not in our study, but in previous studies, um, most of these have come from Western settings. So in places with artificial ventilation spaces, um, but in many places around the world, and also in settings that are not hospital settings, there's not necessarily an artificial ventilator. There's not necessarily an air conditioning unit pumping air out of the room or creating some sort of negative pressure. So what we really wanted to do is to characterize these naturally ventilated spaces. Um, and the WHO for aerosol transmitted um, viruses like tuberculosis has, a, um, has guidance for what the ventilation rate should be. Um, and so that would be more than 12 air changes per hour or more than 60 liters per second per person in a space. Um, so we want to not only characterize, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, yeah, we really wanted to assess the ability to detect COVID in aerosol samples in naturally ventilated healthcare settings. Um, and also to assess that relationship of ventilation with positivity of samples. But we know that if we just go in once to a space and sample it and see if there's COVID or not COVID in that space, that doesn't tell you the risk of the space. So we also wanted to take um, the ventilation parameters of that space and to do some more risk calculations. So based on the ventilation parameters of, of each space that we sampled, if someone who had COVID um, was to come in that space, what would the risk be to the other people in that space? And there's some more established um, models for that based on tuberculosis transmission called the Wells-Riley equation. So I'll get into that later in this talk. Um, so just to give you a brief overview on what we were doing, um, as I mentioned, for data collection, we went into these different hospital settings um, and we collected 30 minute air samples in the middle of the room. So this is at least one meter off the ground and at least one to 1.5 meters away from any patient. We tried to get as far away from patients as possible so that there's not confounding with um, people thinking, oh, this might be droplet transmission that you're detecting, but we really tried to get as far away from patients as possible. Um, and then we analyzed these samples using QPCR, using a CDC optimized assay. And we did two daily negative controls um, both putting a filter over the top of our, our inlet as, as well as running a control far away from any sort of possible um, positive setting back. Um, and then we also collected the ventilation parameters in each, in each room, as I, as I mentioned, the carbon dioxide concentration, the people in the room, the windows and doors. And just so you know, in this bottom right, that's the what the SKC biosampler looks like. So it pulls in air, it sucks it into the bottom collection container, and then we take what is in that collection container and run that um, for, for detection of the virus. Next slide, please. Um, and so these are some of the results that we, we were able to see. Um, and so we took a total of 86 samples. And as I mentioned, these are both from COVID spaces. And what we define as COVID spaces are spaces where there is either a COVID patient, a known COVID patient, or a COVID um, suspected patient. Um, we don't know for COVID patients. We know that people um, are shed virus at different rates during different pieces of their infection. We don't know for COVID patients what day or stage of the infection they were in. Um, and, but and then we also took samples from areas that were considered non-COVID areas. So no one in the space was suspected of having COVID or had COVID. And what you can see here is that, yes, we detected um, over here in the positivity column is the percentage of the tests that tested positive. Um, so both in the COVID spaces, we saw places where we just found COVID in the air um, in between 10 and 20% of the samples. But it, what was really striking was that in places where there were no known COVID patients, especially in the outpatient departments, these are pretty large areas with large number of people in them waiting for um, medical slips, waiting for um, different things at the hospital, that's where we found 50% of the samples that we tested to be positive. Um, and this really shows that it's not necessarily just where we think COVID patients are, where there could be COVID aerosolized in, in just the air that people are breathing, but also in places where we don't necessarily expect COVID patients to be because of that asymptomatic um, type of infection that some people can have. And as I mentioned earlier as well, um, we want to look at the relationship between the ventilation rate of the spaces and if the space is tested positive. Um, and what we, we did not really see any um, strong relationship in the samples that we took. 
However, just taking a sample at a single time point doesn't tell you the risk of the space because maybe at that one time point, someone who was shedding COVID wasn't in that space. But if someone came in to the space later, um, it's really the ventilation rate that it can tell you the um, that can tell you the risk. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, yeah. So as you can see here, the red line is where the WHO recommended um, ventilation um, rate would be, and so what you can see is most of these spaces fall much below that um, recommended ventilation rate of naturally ventilated spaces. Um, and we've been sharing with our hospital partners different ways that they could possibly improve ventilation. And this would all come out as a preprint, um, hopefully next week or the week after. So yeah, I really appreciate all your time listening. Sorry, I went over. Thank you so much uh, for, your, um, for your comments. Uh, I want, we have about uh, 15 minutes in the panel and I, and I wanna get perspective from many of our panelists. I, I would just say, um, what I heard, um, the, the themes that came out to me kind of fall into to, to three, sort of three main areas. Um, one, uh, one is um, our ability to know what's happening, our situational awareness, um, which has a lot to do with our capacity um, for testing, our surveillance, our data systems. Um, and then our ability to integrate it and to know whether what we're seeing re really represents what's happening on the ground. Um, and, and it certainly started out with just understanding whether COVID was present. And of course, now uh, it's a bit more about understanding um, what variants might be emerging and what risk they might pose. Um, the second is what do we need to do about it? And the evidence has been emerging over the year. And I'm not sure that our actions have always been um, keeping up with the evidence. Um, uh, and some countries very early to mask, other countries uh, uh, not, not so much. Um, and then finally, the what can we do um, given people, given human behavior um, and given the availability of vaccines and the vaccine distribution uh, and, and very importantly, um, given the relationship of the public uh, with leadership and with government, uh, how much do people um, trust and understand um, and how, how can, how can uh, leaders um, from everywhere effectively communicate. So those are sort of the themes I, that I heard. Um, I wanna pose um, a, a quick question, uh, just a, a couple questions to the panel. Um, and one is your perspective on uh, now that we're 14 months into a global pandemic, um, how do we uh, communicate and inspire people to keep up with behavior change? I don't know who who on our panel wants to um, com comment on that on that question. How to how to continue to motivate people this long in? Uh, yes, welcome your comments, Agnes. So I I just want to um, uh, just say that uh, it, I say in my presentation it's not in the middle of the war that we create trust. Yes. Okay. So. Many places in the world have lied so much and continuously, and after that, say it didn't lie, that people are not stupid. So I think starting telling truth, but consistently, not the truth that suits you today. And tomorrow I can because I have uh, uh, an election of, of me or my friend in that place, and I need people to forgo COVID. So consistently giving. Uh, uh, telling the truth, even when it's not easy. Second, uh, sharing the situation as it is and show the example. You know, uh, it's difficult for some uh, leaders who came and say, no, there is no problem, no mass today. And after that, they were in hospital and came. I'm convinced now because I was safe. No, I think we need to do it. But for many things, for some countries, for some people, it's a little bit uh, late. And there is somebody who asked me another question about trust as well, that uh, if I trust my numbers, my numbers are the numbers of UNSF, WHO, and USID. So uh, doubt them is just because we are an African country poor, but 
COVID has shown that it's not the sophisticated of your health sector that give you an advantage. It's the way you prepare that to push a COVID to enter and to create damage. Uh, Tari Garcia? Yeah. Thoughts? Well, I think this is, I mean, it is a very difficult question. And, and I want to bring, I mean, I completely agree with Agnes. You cannot just uh, wish that people will follow what you want them to follow and that trust will appear um, just from nothing, okay? But I think we need to start right now that we are in the final phase to prepare for the future pandemics. And that's when we have to start thinking what should we do, right? So I think that a science and scientific institutions have a role on that. And we have talked about social science and we need to learn more about people's behavior, okay? Because it's not, I mean, what we have seen and probably you have seen it all also is that even people that are very well educated may not follow what the recommendations say. There might be con contextual issues. There might be trust behind it. There could be a, a social cultural issues like in Latin America. I mean, one very difficult concept to introduce is the concept of social distancing because we're people that like to be all together, okay? Plus there are, there are social and economic issues like housing or extended families that don't allow you to do quarantines or how to tell people, I mean, don't care for your family, send it to a quarantine place that by the way, were called isolated pl isolation places, which was a terrible choose for a name of, of a place. So I think number one, I think we need to start, we, we need to put science, social science, implementation science, as part of the preparedness for the future to understand how to work better with behavior. Plus, we need to start looking for good examples and lessons around. And I completely agree with that. We need also in general, in the global community, to work to build trust, to be more transparent. And also, I think we need to work building um, also literacy, okay, health literacy, and also science literacy within communities as a way of fighting misconceptions, all these issues of um, bad science and, and hesitancy, etc. So there is a lot that needs to be done. And I think as scientists and as academicians, we have a role on that, but of course, governments will need to realize that and they have a role to do too. I have, I just want to finish that saying that, for example, in Peru, we have done lots of things. I mean, the kind of things that Agnes was saying, I mean, having groups of people visiting door by door houses, trying to do contact tracing, introducing, I mean, we trust very much on our data. And I think we have been one of the countries that is one of the most honest ones on mortality. I think we're even counting more than we should because our confirmed cases are not only PCRs, are even serologic tests, okay? And we have incentives for physicians and for families to report deaths, okay? And, but still having the data, um, having and, and, and trying to do things right is not enough if you don't have a a context that is more stable, political instability, trust in the governments, and you build that trust and knowledge within the community, which I don't think we have been able to do yeah. globally. Yes, <laughs> I agree with the, uh, I, I wanna sort of transition to uh, um, another question uh, that uh, has been posed, uh, which is um, our audience is interested in hearing uh, everyone's thoughts and comments about what can we do uh, in the international community to prevent something like this from happening again, or at least to do um, a better job um, containing and mitigating early. Uh, so I welcome uh, anyone's comments on, on that particular question, as, as well as the um, behavior fatigue question. 
if I may start. Dr. Babu, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think what we need is uh, a real solidarity and partnership building uh, in preventing these kind of pandemics. In the last 15 years, there are six public health emergencies declared by the World Health Organization. These are only going to increase in the future. And most of them are going to be zoonotic diseases. So we need to be promoting one health agenda, strengthen the partnerships among the countries. Currently, it is taking care of oneself and then one own, one's own country probably being at the uh, core of all the defensive strategies. It, this won't help. The reason is, as long as COVID-19 is circulating in any part of the world, that is at higher risk of developing newer variants and is a threat to any other part of the world which has already controlled it. So we need to get our act together. Building global partnership is the way to go. Regarding behavior, I have only one sentence to say. From knowledge to behavior is the most difficult thing. And this is where maximum research and practice has to happen. Thank you. Thank you. I, can I just add what uh, Dr. Babu mentioned? Um, so I think we, uh, as I kind of mentioned, but the, um, for example, this is very Asian approach, but at least in Japanese approach that we didn't have a very strong or strict mandatory to put people stay at home. And then, you know, only the church they can do is probably like you can charge $3,000 US dollars to like a restaurant if they kind of, um, uh, if they kept open their uh, restaurant, for example. So then, but at first, at least we have a very um, unique, uh, like uh, homogeneous, I would, I would say, uh, culture that the, we kind of pressure each other in a sense, in a, actually a negative sense that the, because you are wearing, I am wearing a mask, you should be wearing a mask. I'm not, I'm staying at home. You should stay at home. It's like those kind of peer pressure works very well. And as, as I said, I, there's a lot of, trains in the subway uh, there's a lot of people but people never speaks and uh, everybody 100 percent they wear masks so those cultural one worked in terms of health behavior but i didn't i'm not saying that the other culture back in other countries people in other countries can like do whatever what i we do um, but I think it's important things that we need to have some build the knowledge or narrative hub or whatever um, because there's a lot of data, for example, uh, Dr. Chris is doing the great research for the uh, aerosol transmission stuff. And then also, I think there's a many like small techniques or uh, procedure they have probably implemented in all over the country, not in Japan, of course, in US and Southeast Asia, Africa, wherever, India, of course, and in and Peru. So I think Again, this will probably what just talk about what they do, do uh, in uh, probably frontline providers doesn't necessarily in the paper, but maybe talk in a narrative way. Um, so we making those such a um, um, platform is probably helpful. And then if we know somebody and feels like, oh, it sounds like it's get, get, going getting it's doing well. So we can just, you know, work together maybe. So I think those are the things probably uh, things we academician or I don't know, um, uh, government or uh, uh, like a community level can do uh, together. Of course, as you other people mentioned that, you know, we need to have a good solidarity or partnership. Thank you, over to you. Thanks. Uh, we just have a few more minutes uh, before the panel, but the panel wraps up. Um, uh, wonderful, uh, uh, Agnes. Some comments. You're you're still on mute. Was mm -hmm. a discipline. So I Great. think what we can do uh, that acad you know those the, it's not the academician who enacted the laws and make them enforced. So we need to find a way, and I don't know how, to make government accountable. When we have a dictator that killed 20,000 people, he hand in la egg in criminal courts. When we have head of states that refuse science and the consequences is thousands, hundreds of thousands of deaths, it should be accountable also. So I think if we can make the, 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 the leadership accountable and if we can make them follow science, uh, because that's what I say that was successful here in Rwanda, it's that the leadership follow the science 
and enforce the law. So uh, according, I, I'm, I'm sure this can be done everywhere, but if we don't, there will be other a pandemic and we are going to face the same thing and it's not, it's not uh, possible. Trust need to be built during a normal time, not during this crisis. It has to be something, and, and people are doubting what happened here. I just advise you to read Welcome Trust and Gallup Institute, and you will see how you build trust. Uh, it's not something that we have invented for the health sector. We invent that for the survival of the country after the genocide, and it was successful and expanded in other sectors. So, Sarah. Thank you so in, much. In, yes. In two yes, minutes, please. I think there are the, the two points that are critical, and we are, I, I think we're all agreeing, is we need to really push the international community to understand and accept that a scientific institutions and science should be the driving forces behind global preparedness, and that there are certain principles like evidence-based, multilateralism, solidarity, equity, transparency, and cross-sectional approaches. And the simple <coughs> thing is that we need to identify these priority areas that immediately need investments. And in those, I want to bring two that are critical. So we need to be sure that we can strengthen health systems and laboratories, for example, globally. And the second one, we have to strengthen regional manufacturing capacity. So we have been able, we could be able to have all those tools that could allow us to fight this pandemic and future pandemics. So science, principles, and investments. Thank you so much. Um, uh, what, uh, we have just one more minute, so... Uh, oh, I just wanted to add to um, Dr. Bingalo was, um, sorry, I might have messed up your name, comment, though, of, at, at the beginning of this talk, Michelle Berry talked about how this could possibly be the end of, like, U.S., like, hegemony in the world in some ways, and how, like, as a world, it shouldn't necessarily be always a top-down approach or from the West to other places in terms of how knowledge is transmitted. And I think that here we're needing to learn and learn from actions that others are taking around the world and learn best practices from other places around the world. And Rwanda is a great example for vaccine um, acceptability and getting like children onto vaccines at like more than 90% for polio, measles, um, diphtheria, and and so with COVID vaccinations too, as it becomes more available everywhere around the world, trying to learn best practices from how other countries have structured their vaccination campaigns, um, I think could be really helpful for the US context too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My, just my experience on the ground here in Santa Clara County, I, um, trust is everything and I completely agree. It's something that you build over time. Um, and if you don't have it, you can't do much. Um, and I think we've, it's played out so differently in different parts of, um, of, of the US, but I think that is a critical, critical like core ingredient that if you're missing, it makes a lot of the other um, protective things we're trying to do uh, extraordinarily challenging. Um, so thank you. This was um, really wonderful. I, I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and um, I would love to meet you all in the real world one day. <laughs> instead of over Zoom. Um, and I want to hand things off uh, uh, to Nigam Shah for the next panel on data and research. Thank you again, everyone.